It is March the 24th, 2022. I'm Chris, and this is Curiously Polar. Here we are again. Henry, Mario, and me. Hello. Hello. Hi, how doing? How's everyone doing? Great, really great, great. Nice. Yep. Good to hear. Um, how's the how's the planet doing? <laughs> it's got a fever. <laughs> it's, got, it's got a temperature. Next, and, uh, next question. Yes. <clears throat> uh, well, we are going to talk about some climate-related things today. So there's definitely um, some some planet temperature taking here for sure. Um, yeah. It's our job. It's what we do. We're talking about uh, the article that Henry put up. Um, yes, we uh, let, let's 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 dive in. Well, we are going to talk about a few. Uh, polar newsreel items and then about black carbon which is has been on the news quite uh quite recently and it's a topic that i think is is interesting for us to discuss so let's kick it off with the polar newsreel uh heat waves heat waves are we melting <laughs> what's going on yeah, we are out, uh, heat waves at both um, of Earth poles at the same time. Um, so the coldest place on Earth at uh, Vostok Station in Antarctica that has uh, reported record level temperatures last weekend of minus 70.7 degrees Celsius, roughly zero degrees Fahrenheit, um, which is a shattering 35 degrees Celsius above its usual March average. Um, usually we would have minus 53 degrees Celsius at that time uh, of the year. So it's it's quite a big difference. Uh, it's by far the warmest temperature during March since record keeping began um, around 65 years ago. So it broke our previous record by uh, 15 degrees Celsius. So it's quite quite something that happened there. Um, Vostok Station is famous for holding the lowest temperature record ever observed on Earth, with minus um, 89.2 degrees Celsius, uh, minus 128.6 Fahrenheit in 38 so this is um happening in the south but it's not only vostok that has um had record heat parts of the east of antarctica had reported around 40 degrees celsius above average with concordia weather station um at minus 11.5 degrees celsius roughly 40 degrees above normal and terra nova base on the coast with plus seven degrees Celsius and still some 20 degrees above the average. So what's considered warm is always something that's really relative, uh, particularly um, in a place like Antarctica. Uh, minus 17 is probably not really warm for people uh, in the tropical parts of the planet. But if you consider 35 degrees Celsius um, above the average, that's quite something uh, 35 degrees Celsius um, is something I can't stand. And if you put that on top of the average of that place, it's significantly warmer. So it changes quite something. Especially, I think that uh, we should uh, also point out that uh, temperature is, uh, of course, not an absolute scale, especially Celsius or Fahrenheit. But uh, what what it is an indication of is the amount of heat, so the amount of energy that is stored, and especially stored in the in the water here in the form of ice. So a, a change of thirty degrees uh, is actually quite a lot more heat than that is already in the system is staying there. That uh, that can be uh, quite um, quite a big change for the next uh, the next uh, winter season that is now starting in Antarctica. Indeed. And um, at the same time, we have on the other end of the planet, uh, parts of the Arctic, uh, where we have um, reported extreme temperatures pushing 30 degrees above the monthly average as well. So we have a, a similar picture, just with different temperatures here. Um, the heat records um, have been broken in Norway and extreme um, high temperatures were also recorded in, in Greenland, which is not unlikely that we have simultaneously a uh, occurrence of uh, these two events but um it's very difficult to say if it's coincidental or if that's um something that actually has um something that's re that relates both to each other um in terms of the event in the southern hemisphere we have a very large high pressure system which drove um warm moist air 
from the Southern Ocean down uh, across Antarctica. And we had also a high pressure system southeast of Australia over the Southern Ocean. Uh, maybe we that, should get the, uh, sorry, but maybe we should get the old school um, uh, animation there. Oh, yeah. This Didn't is... you have that? Because that, that would show the... Uh, the pattern of the current. So um, this is the earth.nullschool.net, highly recommended. It's a great playground to see the different currents moving, not just air, but air in different uh, different uh, elevations and um, also water currents in these things. So this, this is a good playground. And um, so we're looking at Antarctica, right? We do, yes. Yep. So let me move this and yeah. here's... Um, here's Antarctica with uh, the different currents. Yeah, so what we can see is the red band around Antarctica. Antarctica is the um, white line around it. So if you're just listening to the podcast, um, I highly recommend hopping over to YouTube and uh, get the visual. Um, or open the, the link. It's, it's in the show notes. Um, the, the, white, uh, the red band around Antarctica, around the continent, that's the jet stream, which is dominated by the global weather patterns. Um, it's transporting uh, warmer winds in high latitudes. And uh, this year, we've seen actually the summer season, we've seen um, a lot of erratic behavior of the um, southern jet stream, bringing a lot of warm air um, into the Antarctic Peninsula. So we had actually quite some warm temperatures there. I've been around in a uh, t-shirt very, very often uh, throughout the season. Um, also concluding in very erratic behavior of sea ice in the Weddell Sea. We had very, very little sea ice. Um, what we also can see is that some warm, moist air uh, came from Australia down to uh, East Antarctica. So the jet stream actually reached much further in uh, on last weekend, bringing in the warm, moist air uh, onto the East Antarctic Plateau, which then brought in the warm uh, temperatures. And it was warm enough that on the coast of Antarctica, it actually came down as rain. And that's really something we have to look at uh, in the long run. It might have been uh, that the uh, rain rackets have been broken in the Antarctica. So average precipitation is usually rather low and typically falls down as snow. If it's too warm as it has been uh, last weekend, then the precipitation comes down as rain and that then mm -hmm. really changes the big picture. Yeah. Wild. Yeah, yes. what's, what's really wild is that we have both um, melting at the same time or the uh, temperature um, change or the, the, the freak temperatures um, happening at the same time on both poles. So we have um, still something um, in, in the Arctic we have to discuss about, uh, the Arctic um, do we, coming do we down. See, do we see something similar up in the yeah, Arctic? Yeah, you do. You do. If you take the North Atlantic there, you you practically have it, and you see that there is this uh, uh, big dip in that goes down to the Gulf of Mexico in North America. It's uh, yep. But there you go. You see the red band that comes down from the Gulf of Mexico comes over all the way to Newfoundland, yeah. takes another little dip down in the North Atlantic, but then goes up to South Greenland, Iceland, and Northern Norway. And I can tell you that even though right now it's kind of snowing a little bit lightly but uh, we have had two weeks of plus eight plus ten degrees which is uh, and rain uh, which has melted a lot of the snow and it's uh, the first time since 2007 when i moved here that i've seen so little snow in march oh we we've this is this this is the end of march we're recording this um mm -hmm. we had a few days of 17 18 celsius right now here in germany mm -hmm. It's unusual. Not it is, and if you if you consider that that the Arctic now comes out of the winter, um, emerges slowly into spring, we are already in spring temperatures here, and above spring temperatures in most places. Um, at the same time, Antarctica is supposed to uh, go into winter mode right now, and still has racket heat temperatures far above average. So there there is um, a big uh, yeah, freak weather happening and the current weather extreme um, is consistent with what scientists have forecasted uh, in, in climate research. And it's likely that we actually see more of those kind of events um, in Antarctica and the Arctic um, in, the, in the next couple of years, in the, in the very near future. 
the rapid rise in uh, temperatures at the ports is kind of a warning of disruption of, of the uh, climate system. And that's what the animation at Null School is very, very good at. You can actually play a little bit around there and check how Earth system is interlinked in all its climate. And you can see the disruptions. If you um, move a little bit over to the North American continent, you can see how the uh, North and Jet Stream is disrupted um, just above the Canadian Arctic and brings in colder air from the north um, quite far south. But at the same time, you have quite some warm uh, air going very, very far north over uh, the Russian Arctic, closer to Barents Sea, which also correlates with our next topic where we have low sea ice um, reports, particularly in the Barents Sea region. Yeah, Arctic sea yeah. ice reaches new low well, record... <clears throat> In February sorry, 2022. This, sorry. No. sorry, it's Antarctic. Uh, this, uh, Antarctic. Uh, in this one here. This is Antarctic <laughs> sea ice. We'll have the Arctic sea ice in a second. True. But uh, we have, uh, we have a, a really nice uh, view here from the Norwegian Polar Institute. is uh, cryo.met.no where uh, we have uh, graphs about the sea ice extent integrated over the whole of Antarctica. And the graph there, if you uh, just go up a little, Bit. So Chris, you're going very fast uh, south. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah, a, there. Am I too fast here? <laughs> yeah. If you if you take the graph on the left, there, it's a curve over the year of uh, uh, the records uh, that have been taken, uh, or the uh, the uh, ice uh, extent that have been taken between. Uh, 2014 and up to now and uh, with the, or the reference curves between 2014 and 17 and uh, it is the median since uh, 1981 uh, and now we are in the graph here at the very minimum extent and we are a record uh, minimum for 2022 the red uh, curve the concentration uh, graph also shows that there is quite uh, um, quite a few parts of the coast that have very little ice concentration and if we go further down then uh, we have some data about the extent but also uh, like the uh, reference uh, period that is between 81 and uh, in 2010 that has a, a median line and then you have the uh, anomalies that have rec been recorded so we can see that we are in 2022 it, we are far down not, as not just anomaly. that but it, it's it's the swings are getting much bigger yes, much, much bigger, the, yes. the oscillation and uh, further down you can see the sea ice concentration in february 2022 for the four regions in the antarctica and uh, also the anomaly uh, for, uh, between what we see in 2022 and what is a reference period between 81 and 2010. And we can see that uh, by the Ross Sea and uh, the Weddell Sea have uh, a very big anomalies where the concentration is far lower than what we would have expected. And so the similar graphs for the sea ice extent, especially for the Ross Sea and uh, for uh, the uh, for the Weddell Sea, that we can see that uh, there is very little ice. It's down to the minimum, uh, if not totally on the minimum. And uh, uh, the site here is also as a as a link uh, a little bit further down where you can download. You can see the ice charts uh, day by day. You can have an archive and you can see the ice charts with the concentration of where uh, the ice is. Uh, it's mostly concentrated. All right. And so the, the the reasons reasons for for um for the reduced sea ice there can be um, manifold. We see that we have kind of a trend uh, in recent years of declining sea ice um, during summer and during winter. But at the same time, um, there are a number of reasons that can come together. We have, of course, a warming ocean, which also uh, intrudes into um, the Southern Ocean by now. So we actually see um, significantly warming in places uh, like the Ross Sea, which then also correlates with the sea ice loss um, in the Ross Sea Amundsen Sea area. Mm -hmm. But we also have strong winds breaking up sea ice in, in the Weddell Sea, for example. We had a lot of storms this season, um, which then breaks up particularly the very young one-year-old ice. And um, it, when you think about that, the Antarctic sea ice is rather young ice. We have very, very little um, lundfast ice that actually grows over years and stays during the summer season. 
um, and then grows bigger mm. over the winter season. So we have a lot of young ice uh, that easily can be broken up through um, stronger w uh, wind patterns. And that's something that has increased as well. So that's just yeah. like two of many factors there. And, uh, and of course, as you're pointing out, the... Uh, satellite pictures, uh, satellite images that give us the information about the extent of the sea ice uh, uh, are not directly giving us uh, the uh, uh, thickness or the age of the ice. So it's just and, the and extent, it's very important, exactly. uh, very important to have uh, that. And but the extent, depending on when the maximum or minimum extents are happening, is also quite interesting. And this brings us to the to the Arctic, where we have a maximum extent of uh, the Arctic ice, which is. Uh, uh, much earlier which has happened at a record early date yeah like two weeks earlier um well, more than two weeks earlier than the average between 81 and 2010 um and it's not only that it's only um a milestone in the 40 uh decade satellite record era we um we are having right now this year's ci's maximum was the 10th lowest so it was not a record in uh terms of the extent it still had 14.88 million square kilometers it covered. It's almost 1 million square kilometers below the average maximum, but it's also still half a million square kilometers above the lowest maximum from 2017. So it's, it's not a racket in terms of the extent of the Arctic sea ice, but it's a racket on uh, when the sea ice maximum has been reached. So from now on, we actually see a start of the melt season, and that is uh, quite stunning that the melt season starts in the Arctic so early. And that correlates then again with a, a freak weather situation we talked about in the heat wife um, item of the of the newsreel. Yeah, that's uh, quite, uh, quite something. And uh, we have uh, both uh, the data from uh, or the, the uh, information from Arctic Today. And, uh, and then uh, we also have the uh, um, information from the... Arctic report card from NOAA that uh, is uh, available in the show notes. And what we also can see in the in the figures uh, in the links in the show notes is that we have uh, a different distribution of the sea ice. We see above long term average extent of the sea ice in some places like the Bering Sea and the Baffin Bay, but at the same time we see way below average in other places like the Barents Sea. Uh, north of Novaya Zemlya, we had a narrow open water edge almost all winter. Uh, the sea ice extent was also well below average in the Gulf of St. Lawrence and in the Sea of Okhotsk. So we see that we have a different distribution. Uh, sea ice is um, changing. It's changing dramatically and it changes um, also in the areas, opening a lot of parts around uh, the European Arctic, particularly in the Barents Sea. Yeah. And I think that uh, if uh, Chris can go in the Arctic report card uh, page, there is a, a graph showing the, the difference one between. Uh, but, uh, no, that's the one that is called the uh, Arctic report card update for 2021. Uh, I don't think I have that open here. Uh, uh, okay, well, uh, then, uh, well, but the, in in that nope. one there, there is a there is a graph uh, with uh, the uh, multi-year ice and the declining multi-year ice since 1981, and the uh, more than four-year-old ice. Uh, how it's is how it's declining and it's a downward curve it's almost gone, for yeah. both of them, and it's uh, it's actually quite. Um, quite uh, something yeah yeah we've, we've seen that in the past uh, past years and we talked about that on the uh, on the show a couple of times that the nursery in the in the Beaufort Sea has almost disappeared so the the uh, the place where actually a uh, one year old ice over summers and actually uh, not melts down but grows thicker the next winter it's just non-existent anymore and when we go back to Nold school we also can see that right now we have actually quite some turbulences over the Beaufort Sea we have quite some warm air uh, mm. in that area breaking up that pattern of uh, the sea ice staying there having a safe haven for being able to grow thicker mm. throughout the winter yeah the uh, the Beaufort gyre is a uh is as you you call it the nursery it's uh and it is very influenced by the uh by the atmospheric circulation on, on top of it and uh and uh, it's uh it's the place to keep an eye on uh it's probably the, going to be the last place with the multi-year ice and um yeah 
quite an interesting place. Well, in <laughs> interesting and quite uh, concerning, if you ask me. Yes. <laughs> but that leads on then to the next topic um, with, a, with a question of less sea ice in the Arctic Ocean will uh, lead to colder winters in the Northern Hemisphere. And, and Mara, you brought that topic. That's where yeah, this comes I in. Okay. Yeah, I found, uh, I found this article uh, from nature.com. Uh, and, uh, of course, it is a, a technical, a scientific article from Nature Communications. Um, but... Uh, it is, uh, if you look at the abstract and the introduction and the discussion, it, it practically tells us that uh, uh, these uh, the authors have looked at uh, trying to find a model or comparing different uh, circulation models uh, that would uh, give an indication of whether the observation that the, the winters are getting... Uh, are getting, uh, let's say, warmer uh, with the uh, with the with the with the icy ice disappearing from the uh, from the uh, from the Arctic. Uh, so they have been uh, they have been looking at the, the westerlies, or so looking at different uh, different indexes, among others the North Atlantic Oscillation Index. So the difference in air pressure between the Azores and Iceland, and uh, and they have been comparing uh, models. Uh, like numerical models to try to figure out whether it was possible to give a uh, an explanation for this uh, trend towards warmer winters or colder winters and uh, it's quite interesting but uh, this is one of those places where the the authors are saying yeah the models explain a little bit of it but uh, it's not really spot on so we don't really know what is it that is actually what kind of parameters we can measure to try to figure out uh, maybe in advance or predict uh, the uh, the climate for the winters in the northern hemispheres So this is just uh, the uh, the North Atlantic Oscillation, for example, accounts only for ten percent of the variations in between the individual years. So there is uh, there is something that uh, some indication that the the uh, atmospheric circulation and the Arctic sea ice have had a, a weakening relationship, but uh, the uh, the models are still not quite there to uh, give an explanation. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So we know yep. that it that is was... happening, but we don't really know why it is happening. Exactly. We don't really know what kind of measures we need to use in order to make a reasonable prediction. And this is this is important for predicting, for example, in the uh, Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, for predicting how the climate is going to behave uh, if the sea ice in in these what if scenarios, what if the uh, wind uh, with the summer sea ice disappears from the Arctic Ocean, what if uh, the winter in the Arctic Sea uh, has a lesser surface of ice. Um, we need to have these parameters and to know how the climate would respond in order to say, like, uh, for example, how much water content there is going to be in the atmosphere, precipitation, and, and the consequences for, I don't know, agriculture, the weather, like uh, the way we need uh, fuel for heating. There is, uh, there is quite a lot that is, uh, that is implied into these studies and that are, these studies are essential for. All right. Uh, let's have a look at our title topic of this episode. Um, so a, a study has gone around and has had quite a lot of press. Um, and it has to do with what's going on in the Antarctic because uh, there's not only scientists down there, there is tourists down there. And those tourists bring things. Or let's say the, the <laughs> transportation of those tourists brings things. We're talking about black carbon pollution from tourism and from research in the Antarctic and how that influences snowmelt. Yeah, what the study just um, brought up is that uh, the place on Antarctica is becoming more and more 
accessible and also more popular. So right now in, in, in the last season, we have actually data from, uh, which is 2019, 2020, we had an average of uh, 74,000 visitors that actually reached Antarctica that year with a vast majority traveling by ship. Uh, as we know, ships obviously uh, use uh, marine diesel, so they're actually polluting. Um, scientific activities uh, on the continent have has also significantly increased, and now we have more than 70 research stations, um, which are collectively housing around 5,000 uh, researchers during the Austral summers. And during winter, we still have around 1,000, 2,000 uh, scientists on the continent. And all these activities, um, which is even projected to increase more in the future, they leave a physical footprint. And um, that physical footprint actually has quite a lasting consequence. Um, all those activities um, need or burn fossil fuel, uh, need to power drills for scientific ice coring or vehicles to, to go somewhere. Um, the ships, snowmobiles, everything needs uh, fossil fuels. As we burn fuel to keep warm or move around, our activities release those microscopic particles of um, black carbon, which is actually smoke and soot, which you also um, yeah, can just uh, find in your in your chimney when you burn wood, right? It's, it's pretty much the same thing. So elsewhere in the world, black carbon uh, is released in enormous quantities by forest fires and, uh, and other human activity. It travels great distances, and we have seen that in 2019, 2020, when we had those humongous bushfires in Australia, and that travel around the world. You can actually find traces everywhere around the planet from that um, period of bushfires. Yet, in Antarctica, which is really isolated through this very strong barrier of the circumpolar uh, current, the sources of black carbon are typically very, very uh, small and very local, so we actually can really trace uh, the origins, and that what that study actually did. Um, this new research has now extensively quantified the levels of um, the black carbon in the snow, and they collected samples from 28 different locations. Uh, the locations stretched um, across 2,000 kilometers um, through Antarctica, and they're stretching from the Antarctic Peninsula to the interior of the Western Arctic ice sheet, where we have the biggest aggregation of human impact. The results, they are really, really, really sobering. Um, we found um, that tourist activities uh, specifically uh, brought a lot um, footprint into Antarctica. Each visitor uh, effectively um, is responsible for melting around 83 tons of snow between 2016 and 2020. That's four years. It's uh, roughly 20 tons a year, uh, largely to, uh, due to emissions from, from cruise ships. Um, that gives quite some uh, big spotlight on tourism, but the study also went further and looked into the impact of scientific activities. And there are no exception. In fact, uh, scientific research stations contribute up to 10 times more um, than that of tourists. And that's uh, quite an astonishing figure as we um, have scientific research stations in Antarctica to research the impact of, of, of climate change um, to Antarctica, but also to the bigger uh, planet. Now we see that this research actually contributes to an accelerated melting there, and that is really difficult because everybody's using diesel for powering all those um, activities. Those Elevated um, levels of black carbon, they influence the snow, um, the snow melt as this, the, the, the look of the snow changes, actually. So the snow absorbs um, more light than it actually reflects. So the albedo actually goes down, which is the, um, the, the variable we, we use for um, the reflectivity of snow. So a snow with a low albedo, uh, albedo melts faster, right? So up north... In the Arctic, we have a very similar picture, and we know about the threat from black carbon there for a much, much longer time because the Arctic is a much, much more accessible, but also much closer connected to human habitation. So when black carbon uh, is emitted from the exhaust of ships there uh, and settlements, and it settles on snow and ice, it accelerates the melting there, obviously, as well. And we have quite some data in the Arctic which we still don't have from Antarctica yet. And what we know in the Arctic is where the sources of black carbon 
are from. And Mario, you've been involved in, in, in those uh, research, haven't you? Well, not directly in the research as a researcher, but uh, at AMAP we look at uh, at the at black carbon in the Arctic, and uh, and the black carbon is uh, one of the uh, one of the big themes. Uh, there is a, a project that we have with the with the EU that we will look at in a little second. But maybe Chris, you can put the CC coalition. Uh, the C coalition dot uh, org uh, graphics, so we can we can see a little bit uh, about black carbon. Um, there was Here this we go. nice, yeah, that one there. So, uh, like uh, black carbon. Uh, Henry just uh, mentioned there are a few few sources and and here we can see that uh, 51% of the of the black carbon comes from household energy production and 26% from transport uh, agriculture with practices of burning the fields uh, accounts for 8% of it industrial pro production 5% and then burning waste and fossil fuel operations and large scale combustions are the uh, uh, the rest uh, of the uh, in general the rest of the black carbon um, wildfire burning also the burning of uh, the tundra the burning of forest uh, they happen both uh, like you, Henry you mentioned on, in Australia but uh, there they happen also in in Siberia in Russia in uh, North America they produce also a lot of soot and a lot of these fires are not uh, provoked directly by men or voluntarily by by mankind the uh, lifetime in the atmosphere is quite uh, long for a, such a small particle is up to two weeks but uh, in these two weeks they can the these particles can travel quite a lot and uh, they uh, go on the ice but they can also be going on populated areas and they can increase the risk of heart disease or stroke and lung disease because these are very very small particles that uh, um, can be inhaled and if you go further down a little bit, Chris, uh, please, there is a black carbon emissions uh, for the different continents. And uh, the, uh, um, the anthropogenic black carbon and the projections are quite... Um, are quite uh, dire. I mean, in Europe, there are in North America, there are actions for um, for reducing the uh, the uh, the black carbon, and uh, and here you can see which kind of sectors uh, are the uh, ones that uh, are going to be worked on, and also what is the projected change that is going to happen. And we see that the projected change goes from uh, for uh, the from the up to two thousand and thirty. Uh, the year 2030 goes down to minus 73 percent uh, the uh, best uh, scenario for north america and northern europe but uh, we are for example of minus 56 percent so much less uh, for latin america and the caribbean and uh, uh, the uh, there is an impact uh, on of course on all the economy here um, for uh, the way we uh, um we we use uh, black carbon it is of course uh, some health issues but uh, we call it also a, a a climate forcer because it has a warming impact that is between 460 and 1500 times stronger than the co2 per unit of mass so it's much much so it has a much stronger effect on the climate Fortunately, it's not uh, the the quantity of black carbon is not as elevated as the quantity of CO two. So um, yeah, that's um, and uh, yeah, well, that's uh, the one thing that we could say. Um, how to reduce black carbon emission? If we go to the Clean Arctic uh, uh, site, uh, that's another nice site that uh, talks about black carbon. We can reduce black carbon emission by changing the kind of fuels, like the Princess Elizabeth station in Antarctica is that we mentioned because of the COVID <laughs> breakout that they've had, is a uh, one of the stations that is trying to use wind energy and solar energy as much as possible, so reducing the use of fossil it's, fuels. It's also the only uh, net zero research station in Antarctica. That's also very important to mention, as they only... Uh, work on renewable 
um, energies and run on solar and wind energy. Yeah. That, so that would have been uh, my next question, really you know. There's, yeah. there's a whole big wave of green energy, uh, at least in some parts of the world. And uh, the question is, how, how much is possible? How much is possible in those areas where it's really cold and batteries maybe and don't work as well? And there is a difference between the Arctic and Antarctica. In the Arctic, we have uh, quite a big bunch of factors that, um, that emit actually or contribute to the emit emission of uh, black carbon. In Antarctica, right. we have only two. One is uh, the shipping from tourists, and the other one is from scientific research, from scientific uh, activities. And here we actually can reduce the impact much, much easier than in the Arctic, as in the Arctic, we have so a widespread human impact which we don't have in Antarctica that much. Yeah. And so the uh, the one thing that is related to transport, so, so ships, ship transport and, and land transport is uh, is using a, a, a distillate diesel fuel, so a, a lighter diesel fuel that reduces just by itself black carbon emission uh, a lot. Uh, a lot of the ships, uh, uh, they are still... Uh, they are still allowed to run on heavy fuel oil, which is a very thick fuel that needs to be heated in order to be pumped into the engines. And it's of course cheaper because it's closer to the original to the original petrol that is coming out. I mean, the original oil that is coming out of the rocks. So it's it's cheaper to produce. And it's also like once you have removed the the more noble compounds, like uh, like the ones that go into producing gasoline, then you have this. Uh, this kind of uh, tarry uh, uh, mass that is uh, that is can be used for burning there, but uh, this is extremely extremely polluting it because of the uh, uh, large number of particles of black carbon that are that are produced there. And uh, of course, filters can be used. There are different systems for ships that are more or less effective uh, on the long term. I mean, there are these uh, uh, systems that wash the. Uh, the fumes coming out of the of the ship and and actually wash the black carbon particles into the ocean, which is a uh, palliative measure, but it doesn't help very much the environment. And uh, and then there are of course using better engines and like more uh, refined forms of fuel that uh, move the uh, the problem somewhere else as well. <laughs> and using particle filters that actually catalyze. I mean, like most cars now in in Europe uh, are. Have a, a euro and a number class so in diesel cars so you have a euro five euro six i don't know how <laughs> where, where we will stop with these euros but these are uh, also measures of uh, how much of uh, particulate comes out of the uh, of the uh, of the exhaust so like a, even diesel cars they don't have a, a a catalyst like a uh, like a petrol car but uh, they have a, a like a, a post furnace that burns the black carbon so it doesn't come out as black carbon but comes out as co2 <laughs> which is of course also it's not uh, really a helpful force <laughs> but <laughs> but okay. it's it's less dangerous to to uh, to breathe yeah. okay um let me try to end this episode on a on a more positive note because there is something that recently happened and I have not told the two of you because I just I just uh, pulled this up um, last week we had was it last week last in the last couple of weeks we had a phenomenon uh, here in Europe that happens every now and then and that's Sahara dust being transported in the atmosphere particles being transported in the atmosphere from one place to the other and um, there has been uh, uh, research on what that does now of course what that does here and it came up to northern germany here so it's, it doesn't happen too often but um we had like long lines at the car wash and uh, like really in the in the south in in some ski areas you had like red sand uh, red, red snow that looked like you were skiing on mars so it was really interesting um but what nasa found out in their research is that those particles um, do carry things around the planet that are helpful in some way. And in this case, they measured that um, a not insignificant amount of Sahara dust ends up in the Amazon and gets deposited there. We're talking tens of thousands of tons of Sahara dust uh, coming down in the 
Amazon. And that dust is not just dust, it contains phosphorus. And that is important as a nutrient for plants. So it uh, turns out that um, that that is about this that is a similar amount um, that gets lost in the Amazon every year because of being washed out. So uh, the Sahara dust replenishes the Amazon's um, grounds and but that's, and that's the amazing them. it's amazing lesson we learn from that that nature. Uh, tends to be balanced um when we are not impacting it right? sometimes yeah so, yeah <laughs> at least sometimes but it's a it's a it's a good example of a of a nicer feedback mechanism that uh, that tries to like that tries to diminish the effect of deforestation on the one side of the planet by uh, helping the, the could, vegetation on the other side of the planet i mean there is no intention behind all of this but there well, is a, some people an equilibrium. Say it might be the gaia thing uh doing <laughs> doing its thing the earth being an organism of sorts i wouldn't go that far but um yeah it might be something um that's at least interesting to look at and kind of leaves us with a bit of a hopeful note hopefully um that was it for this episode of Curiously Polar, uh, we'll be back next week with more cool stuff to show you. You can, of course, find us at CuriouslyPolar.com, Curiously Polar on the Twitters, and um, yeah, get in touch. Let us know what interests you. We'll be back soon. Until then, bye. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm.